Hello, everybody. Welcome to Shop Talk Live. I'm Andrew from Miller, and tonight we're going to be going over the tips and techniques of TIG welding. Um, we've had a number of uh, inquiries or questions that have been submitted ahead of time via different social media channels. Um, we're going to be trying to go through as many of those questions and get them answered tonight as we possibly can. And if you have any additional questions throughout the way, um, we have uh, a gentleman that's going to be moderating for us that uh, will stop periodically um, as time permits to try to answer any questions that are submitted via the chat function. Um, one of the first questions that I would like to address that has been submitted is what is a good way to get into TIG welding for cheap and what do I need to start? So um, Miller offers a variety of different uh, solutions to get into TIG welding. Uh, the first would be our diversion product. It's an AC-DC TIG machine that can be uh, utilized for uh, welding any different material. Uh, one of the uh, things to consider is uh, a lot of times is where you are in the progression of your TIG welding skills and where do you want to be. So tonight we're going to actually be utilizing um, a Dynasty uh, 300 product. It's a new product that was launched this year that uh, helps kind of bridge some of the gaps between you know, those that have some welding experience and maybe want to get to a little bit higher level uh, with their TIG welding. So um, we're going to be going over a number of different things today, starting really back at the basics of uh, everything from the connections on the machine all the way up through how to hold your filler rod, how to hold your torch, uh, what gases to use, some of the different accessories that are, are utilized throughout the process uh, to help give everybody a really grounded understanding of the TIG welding process and hopefully get you uh, set on a good track for success. So um, what I would like to start off with is um, kind of going through the different connections that need to be made and uh, talking about um, some of the different accessories. So one of the things that we really want to focus on or, or think about uh, from the get-go is uh, what is our welding torch? Uh, the, there's different torch options. There's an air-cooled torch like this one that I have in my hand here. The Dynasty that we're going to be talking about tonight has a water-cooled torch. Uh, this really gets into how much welding are you planning on doing. If you're planning on doing a little bit of welding or occasional welding, or you're going to be doing more mobile or portable applications, an air-cooled option is a great place to start because you don't have to have um, all of the water circulator uh, and the, coolant, the weight of the coolant and all of that uh, being uh, transported out to the job site. If it's more of a shop application, uh, you're doing high, maybe high temperature, high, you know, high uh, amperage applications, that's going to be where you want to um, utilize uh, a water-cooled system because the torches for the same size torch or similar size torch carry typically about twice to three times the uh, amperage carrying capacity as an air-cooled torch. So that is a great, uh, a great thing to remember when you're trying to think about what do I need in order to get started. Um, the next thing that we want to talk about is the different triggering types. So when you talk about starting your uh, TIG welding process, typically the, the torch is not live and there's not a uh, current uh, flowing out to the front of the torch before you start the process. You need to have some method of triggering. So there are different methods of triggering it depending on the application. Um, sometimes uh, if you're doing things like a roll cage, there can be... Uh, you know, you're, you're oftentimes moving into a, a, a space where you can't be utilizing a foot pedal. So the foot pedals are typically used more for bench application. The particular style that we're going to be uh, utilizing on the Dynasty tonight uh, is our wireless version. So there's no cord uh, transmitting the signal between the, uh, the actual control that we're interfacing with and uh, the receiver that plugs into the front of the machine. The, uh, like I mentioned, the roll cages... Um, that's going to be something you're going to mount it to the top of the torch. This particular style is a north-south control, so that, that being the actual thumb wheel um, spins uh, up and down uh, along the axis of your handle. And then there's also the east-west styles uh, It's based off of preference. And then uh, what we see a lot in uh, more field-type applications where you're doing a little bit higher amperages, you don't need that uh, you know, really fine control that's offered by this uh, sort of uh, control, either the foot pedal or the fingertip control, is uh, a push button. So the push button can be utilized multiple different ways. It can be uh, utilized just as a momentary. So simply press it and your arc stays on for as long as it's being pressed and you release it, the arc goes off. Or you can uh, program uh, some of the more advanced machines 
to step through a pre-programmed sequence based off of uh, your experience and your, your application. So I'm gonna set this stuff aside a minute. The next thing that I wanna talk about is going to be um, the gas. So gas control is something, uh, the TIG welding process does use a shielding gas and you need to be mindful that uh, there are different types of shielding gas uh, that are available uh, for different welding applications. Um, the beauty of TIG welding is that uh, all of the materials that you can weld with TIG uh, can typically be done with 100% argon. And uh, if you have maybe some experience with a MIG welder, you don't necessarily have, uh, you know, the, the shielding gases that we have, um, you know, you can't necessarily use the same shielding gases. So there are, like I said, different types of regulators available, regulators and flow meters. This particular style you can see comes with uh, a female threaded configuration. This is going to be for a CO2 type uh, shielding gas for MIG welding. So be mindful if you have accessories for MIG welding, some of them may or may not be able to be used for the TIG welding process. The two most common regulators uh, or gas control devices that, that uh, are utilized is gonna be, uh, they both accomplish essentially the same thing. One is going to be a regulator flow, uh, flow uh, gauge that utilizes uh, controlled orifice sizes and different pressures uh, through the regulator to give you a, a fairly accurate uh, representation or of the flow that you're getting out to the end of your torch. And then the most accurate methodology is a, a regulator flow meter that actually utilizes a floating ball um, through the, uh, through the, the, the shielding gas causes the ball to float up into the uh, to the tube and then there's numbers on here it's not really uh, easy to see in the in the video but there's different numbers that are associated with different flow rates uh, on the the front of the uh, the front of the meter there so just to kind of talk briefly as I uh, hook this up um, there are different types of uh, shielding gases that are utilized for the TIG welding process, the most common being an argon shielding gas. So argon can be used uh, with steel, stainless steel, aluminum, um, and those are gonna be the most common materials that you encounter throughout the, uh, you know, throughout the different applications. So we're gonna go ahead and hook the, uh, the flow meter up here. So you saw that I cracked, stood to the side and cracked the uh, the valve to blow any, uh, you know, potential dust and debris that could, could be in that valve out of it. And we're going to go ahead and snug this up and we're going to hook our hose up. So this is really the first step. You can't, uh, you can't do the TIG welding process without shielding gas. So we need to have this hooked up in order to, to proceed any further. Now you don't have to over tighten that. Everything just uh, snug, and then we're gonna go ahead and crack this slow. And then with high pressure cylinders, we always wanna back seat them with a high pressure cylinder like this. That seals the valve um, up at the top and we don't rely on the packing. So the next thing that I wanna cover is going to be um, kind of some of the different connections that are on the front of the machine. And if we look at the uh, different connections here, you can see it, we have um, a 14 pin amphenol connector on this Dynasty 300. Different products are gonna have different connector types. Um, all of our Miller TIG products, with the exception of some of the smaller, more portable products, use this 14 pin amphenol. Um, we have uh, a gas port for our shielding gas to come out to, to the torch. We have a, uh, a torch or an electrode holder connection. And then we have a work clamp connection here. You can see the little symbols here. This being an ACDC product, we automatically switch the polarity based off of the welding process that you have selected on the front of the machine. So the first step we're gonna, we're gonna utilize, we're gonna connect our uh, 14 pin receiver to allow us to utilize the uh, wireless foot control later on um, after we get everything else set up. The next thing that we have is um, our water connections. So you can see here, 
we have the red line and the blue line. So if you think about this from a, a temperature perspective, just like the faucet in your kitchen or the faucet in your bathroom, the blue water is the cold water going out that goes all the way out to the head of the torch because that's where the most heat is being generated. And then the, the uh, water comes back through the red power cable. So there's a copper conductor in here that we're cooling that the entire way back to the power source that helps us get a smaller power cable that's a little bit um, more flexible and a little bit lighter weight to improve the operator comfort. Again, one of the benefits of using a water-cooled system with a uh, higher amperage application is we can use that smaller conductor because we uh, have a more efficient cooling process with that liquid. So quarter turn din, quarter turn, uh, din style connection, insert it in, just snug it up. Um, both of the water connections I already have connected here, and those are uh, a left-handed thread. So there's a little uh, line cut into the, um, into the uh, actual nut portion of those connections, indicating that it's a left-handed thread. That's done intentionally to make sure we don't mix that up with this connection, which is a, our shielding gas connection. So this supplies shielding gas out to the torch. Just go ahead and um, turn that in finger tight, and then we're going to snug that down. Again, don't over tighten these. They don't have to be reefed down. And also, um, it is uh, uh, somewhat of an inverted flare style connection. So we don't need to use any thread tape and actually thread tape would be detrimental to what we're doing here. Um, and then the last connection that we need is complete the electrical circuit going out to whatever we're welding on. And um, go ahead and stick that in and give it a turn and we're all set to go there. So I'm gonna power, the, power this up. So while we're down here, I'm just gonna go through quick some of the settings that we're gonna uh, utilize. We wanna make sure that we have the um, appropriate settings for our application. So I'm gonna go ahead and go into the process menu. So this machine gets set up left to right. So we go into process, and you can see here there's all of the different welding processes that we can utilize the different starting modes. So starting with AC and DC TIG with our high-frequency non-contact arc starting. This is going to be great for an application where um, you are working on uh, maybe an x-ray quality component, and you don't want to be touching the tungsten to the part and potentially contaminating or leaving tungsten deposits that will show up in an x-ray. The uh, lift arc starting method, really an excellent starting method. Um, you don't have the high frequency interference that can interfere with different electronics, uh, like telephone systems, things like that. If those are anywhere near the welding environment, um, a lot of times, uh, you know, internet connections can have a, a brief interruption uh, due to high frequency, things like that. So just to ensure that we don't have any issues with our stream tonight, I'm going to go ahead and go down and I'm going to use DC lift arc. Um, so that gets rid of the high frequency interactions that, that could potentially happen. So now that that is selected, you can see that the, uh, the check mark has moved down here. Now we're going to go down to our uh, bottom soft keys and we're going to select the, uh, the trigger. So in the trigger, as I mentioned, there's different methods of starting our arc and turning the output on uh, that I touched on earlier. We're going to go ahead and say that we're using a foot pedal because with our wireless receiver here, that is what we're going to be utilizing tonight. So I'm going to go back to the home screen. The last setting that I have to um, establish is our welding amperage. I know that we're going to be welding on material that's uh, about a sixteenth of an inch thick tonight. So we know that, um, and I'll go over some of the different tips for setting our amperage. Based on my experience, we're going to be probably down in the... Um, 80 to 90 amps range. I like it a little bit on the higher end because I do have the ability to control my amperage with the foot pedal. So one of the things that we want to, um, to look at now um, before we get started is our actual flow. So somebody had submitted a question, do you read the regulator from the, from the ball top or the middle? So um, 
typically the, those uh, flow meters or flow gauges are going to be something that there's technically not a calibration for them. Like, for example, the aerospace industry views these types of devices as not being a calibratable device. Um, so essentially, wherever you uh, develop your welding procedure and qualify your welding procedure from, you want to maintain that same measurement device. I will typically go off of the bottom of the ball um, because that is going to be airing on the, you know, very ever so slightly on the upper side of the, the flow range. So if I go back here and go to um, go over here, I'm going to hit my foot pedal and actually um, look here. So you can see if I am flowing my shielding gas, I need to adjust this down. I want to be at about 20 cubic feet per hour um, for the, the shielding gas flow rate for what we're doing. So again, I have everything all set up on the front of my machine. All my connections are good. Um, now we're going to go ahead and uh, go over some of the uh, front end consumables. So there are a number of different consumables that are used in the TIG welding process. And this is going to be the next step to getting set up. Gas lenses versus collet bodies. Um, a lot of equipment and a lot of welding distributors uh, readily carry what is called a standard collet body. And a standard collet body is going to be Um, just a copper, uh, a copper tube that screws into the head of the torch, and then we have our collet, which actually holds the, the tungsten electrode, goes through that, um, and uh, I don't know if you can see it in the video, there's a little slit cut in the side. As that gets pushed by the back cap up into the, uh, into the collet body, it actually crimps down onto the, uh, onto the tungsten electrode. On our premium products like the Dynasty product, we have started including a gas lens kit. So a gas lens kit um, in comparison for an air-cooled torch is going to be um, a little bit different design. So you can see here there's a, a, a screen that goes um, in the front of this. So we, uh, we actually press these all together in our uh, facility in Appleton, Wisconsin here. Um, so all of the, the brass or the copper and brass components are machined right here in Appleton, and uh, this uh, standard collet body has the holes or the orifices coming out. That produces a shielding gas stream that is essentially flowing out sideways, and as that goes inside of the gas cup, it has to hit the wall of the gas cup and turn in order to come out um, and, and cover your weld. A standard or a, a gas lens has uh, screens that actually acts like an aerator, like you would have on your kitchen sink, and it actually produces a laminar flow um, over the um, over the weld. We have a, a great video. If, if anybody wants another resource to look at, just go to go to you know Google or YouTube and search Miller gas lens, and we have some great videos that show the laminar flow that's produced by a gas lens and the different gas flow rates, different orifice sizes, things like that um, with your gas cups. So I'm going to go through, now that we've kind of talked about the different types of consumables that are available, I want to show everybody because a, a lot of people are probably wondering what is the best way to go ahead and load the front of a torch and how to, how to put everything in here. So I'm going to lay everything out on the bench and let everybody kind of see what the how all this stuff goes together. So these are going to be all of our different all of our different pieces. We have our tungsten, we have our collet body, uh, collet body gas lens assembly. Uh, we actually have the collet, um, the back cap, or a gas cup. The first thing that we want to do whenever we assemble a torch, obviously um, make sure that you know the torch is in good shape. This is a brand new torch, so we don't have to worry too much about that. We have both of our insulators in place. Start with our either a collet body, if that's what you're using, or in this case, we're using the gas lens. Take and thread this in the front side of the torch and just snug that down finger tight. 
Then what we're going to do is we're going to slide our, um, our actual collet inside the back of the torch. So you can see it's just sitting down inside the back of the torch. Then I'm going to go ahead and take my tungsten. Um, it's, this one's already been sharpened. We're going to go ahead and feed that inside through the collet. I'm just kind of holding this in place, and then we're going to put the back cap over the top of it. Now, I'm not tightening this down yet. It's, it's threaded on there, but it's still, it's still loose. I can still move my tungsten around. And then we're going to put the actual gas cup or our nozzle over the top of the gas lens assembly. Typically, um, kind of rule of thumb that is a good place to start for most applications is the back of your taper on your tungsten should be about at the front edge of this nozzle. Once we have that in place, we can go ahead and snug our back cap down. Again, don't reef on this. It's not, you know, that we're using that mechanical forces and that uh, force multiplier of the, the fine threads with that collet and collet body assembly to hold the tungsten in place. One thing that you'll find is that a lot of times if your uh, tungsten is not being held into place properly, maybe you have the wrong uh, combination of consumables, things like that. Um, or you have the uh, actual collet is, um, is worn out. So um, what can happen is the front of that collet can pretzel if you have a, uh, uh, a consumable that's manufactured with inferior materials um, or it's been you know, tightened when it was really, you know, really hot, things like that. That can af negatively affect or impact the, um, the you know, longevity of your consumables and the ability to, uh, to go ahead and um, you know, have everything lock in the way it should. So now that we've kind of gone over that, um, what I'm going to, what I would like to do is uh, kind of talk and go over some of the uh, different amperage settings. So I had mentioned earlier that we wanted to talk about some of the, um, the different amperage uh, configurations, things like that. But before we get there, we did have a question that came in um, that talks about the typical torch setup, tungsten size, cup size, uh, cup type, and all of that. Um, there are a lot of different combinations with TIG welding based on your application. One of the things that um, I would say for most applications, uh, if, you're, if you're not doing real, any really critical work, a coll standard collet body is going to be your cheapest option. Uh, they're not as labor intensive to manufacture. Um, these gas lenses have anywhere from three to seven uh, different screens in them. Um, and they're all hand packed. There's, they're, it's not an automated process. It's very labor intensive, which is partly why they cost so much. Um, when we look at the benefit of it, though, is it really provides that great laminar flow. Like I said, get on uh, YouTube, go see that video that we had put together for that. Show some great color video and photography um, that will, I think, a picture speaks a thousand words there. As far as the cup size, tungsten size, things like that. Um, there are different recommendations for the different tungsten sizes. So for example, if you're welding really thin material, a 16th inch or less, you're gonna be using typically 60, uh, 60 amps or less on that material, 60 thousandths, so about 60 amps. Um, you're gonna need less than a 16th of an inch uh, tungsten size for your diameter. As you go up in amperage, or if you go to an AC welding process, so AC for aluminum, DC for steel and stainless steel, uh, you're going to need, um, you know, a little bit larger tungsten diameter. When we talk about the tungsten types, uh, there are uh, multiple different tungsten types that are available out there. The one that we're going to be using today is a 2% seriated tungsten or the gray band. If you have some of the old stuff, it's going to be the orange band. Um, it, the industry has swi switched for, uh, away from the orange band from the AWS classifications probably more than 10 years ago. Uh, so now you'll see it's the gray band. Uh, the, the dark blue, which is the 2% lanthanated tungsten, uh, is a great option for, for, you know, really low amperage arc starts. Um, you'll see other tungstens out there. There's uh, the 2% the uh, thoriated tungsten or the red band um, that's not as common in the industry anymore. That has uh, slowly been phasing out over the past 10 years. Uh, you know, there's zirconiated tungstens, um, which are, you know, going to be a, like a kind of a gold color, color band. 
But the 2% lanthanate is good for all material types. The 2% serrated that we're using here is a good, fairly low cost option um, that, that can help you get started uh, without really breaking the bank. So as far as the different cup sizes, um, the, the, essentially the, what you're going to be looking at is the gas coverage that you need. The higher the amperage, the more gas coverage you need. The lower the amperage, the less gas coverage, um, you know, the less uh, puddle size you're going to have on your part. So keep that in consideration. If you're using, you know, an, trying to do things like an exhaust header, where you're trying to get into really tight applications, where you know you got a really deep joint that you're trying to, uh, you know, reach that tungsten down into, a larger diameter nozzle or a larger diameter cup with a gas lens can actually benefit you by providing a longer laminar flow of your shielding gas. What what does that mean? It means you can now stick your tungsten out, not this far. I'm exaggerating with this. But it allows you to stick your tungsten out further to reach down into those, you know, varying joint conditions uh, to ensure that you have good gas coverage. So a lot of people think smaller gas cup uh, for, for for tighter applications. When in reality, if you utilize a gas lens, you now again, it, it has to be a gas lens to do that. Um, use a larger, a little bit larger cup with a gas lens and the appropriate flow rates. Now you can stick your tungsten out a little bit further. Helps you access those different configurations. So I think we've kind of talked a little bit uh, about the torch here, um, probably covered enough on that. Uh, hopefully everybody has a, a clear understanding of what we're doing there. If you have questions still, you know, throw them into the chat. Otherwise, we're going to go ahead and, and jump over here, and we're going to talk a little bit about how we uh, figure out what amperage we need for our actual welding application. So joint configuration plays a lot into what we're doing here. So I mentioned earlier that we're going to have one amp for every thousandth of material thickness um, is a good rule of thumb. So if you're welding 16th inch material, it's a 60 thousandths, roughly 60 thousandths thick. You're going to need about 60, uh, 60 amps or so. If we're doing eighth inch material, 0 0.125 or 125 thousandths of an inch, um, we're going to need about 125, 130 amps. There is a caveat to this. And so I'm going to draw this out on the board here. And what we want to look at is the actual joint configuration because we have to take into account the thermal mass of whatever we're welding. So I said um, that, you know, 60,000 thick or 060 inches is going to be about 60 amps. That's when we're looking at a joint configuration, assuming that our tungsten is coming from the top. And we are trying to get an arc cone and trying to get penetration through the part like this. We have heat can go two different directions, to the left and to the right. So what does this mean for us when we're, when we're looking at different types of joint configurations? If you have um, uh, more of a T-joint configuration, we have to take that into account. Because what do we see here? Both of the material thicknesses, um, I'm going to say, is 60 thousandths. But we can have heat if we're, if we're trying to put a weld down in the bottom of this corner here, trying to put a little fillet weld in here. It would probably actually be a little bit bigger fillet weld than that. We have to take into account that heat can go three different directions. It can flow up that vertical member. It can flow back away from us on the horizontal member. It can also flow forward from us on that horizontal member. So now we have to take into account heat can go into three, can go, flow in three different directions um, from where we're, we're trying to produce our weld. So um, if we were at 60 amps before, now we're going to need more amperage. So I would probably set my machine um, maybe somewhere in the area of um, probably about 90 amps in a configuration like this. I, I might not need that full 90 amps, but what it's going to do is with my foot pedal, I can control my heat. I know I'm going to need probably at least 60 amps, but I can be as much as 90 amps, and I can throttle that with my foot pedal. Let's look at one other configuration here. Um, as we look at parts of different thicknesses, how we point and angle our torch is also going to vary. So if we're trying to weld, let's say, a a 0.25 or, um, or a quarter inch thick material to maybe an eighth inch thick member. 
or 0.125. Now again, we, we're going to probably want to, um, we have a thicker member here. Again, heat can flow in two different directions on this part, and heat can flow up in the vertical member. So we have to take into account that not only are we going to have to increase our amperage because we have more thermal mass in this piece here, we are also going to have to bias our torch more down, you know, pointing the heat more to this thicker member because this thicker member is a very large heat sink. And so that's uh, going to take a lot more um, energy in order to get a puddle established. So by, by biasing our torch towards that member, um, I, my recommendation is start the puddle in this member first, and typically there's enough heat both conducted and um, absorbed through radi you know through the uh, you know radiant absorption that will help us build our weld puddle kind of into that corner. So um, we've kind of talked about amperage here. Um, the next thing that we want to look at is um, is going to be the James, if you can go ahead and switch it over to the front camera here. So the next thing we want to talk about is how we hold our torch. Um, so there's two different factors that we have to take into consideration here, the torch and the filler rod. So our filler rod, for those that are just learning how to weld, filler rod typically comes in about a 36-inch stick. Um, sometimes you can get filler rod in a... Uh, a 43 inch thick um, stick. I would recommend because you have, as you're doing this, you can see this particular uh, filler rod has a lot of wobble to it. As you move your hand around, it's going to be wobbling. It's going to make it hard for you to stay steady. I'm going to go ahead and take my whelpers here and I'm going to cut this filler rod right in half. That's going to reduce the moment that I'm going to be fighting um, as I'm welding um, on, this, on this part. So I'm going to take my, my TIG torch, and I want to make sure that um, the general consideration that we have here is that I uh, start with about, with TIG welding, we always use a push angle. So I'm right-handed. Um, if you're left-handed, just think about this in opposite terms. You're going to go ahead and take your TIG torch. If, if you're not using filler rod, straight up and down, tip your torch about 10 to 15 degrees. So if I look at this and um, kind of put this piece out here, I have my, uh, my uh, TIG torch straight up and down. I do about a 10 to 15 degree push angle. That is going to be for doing something like, you know, basic bead on plate. If you're trying to do an autogenous weld where maybe I'm, um, you know, just trying to do a butt weld, trying to join two pieces of material together, I would just, I could, on stainless steel, I could just, you know, run an autogenous bead down there. But if I wanted to add filler, filler metal, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my, filler, my torch, again, 10 to 15 degree push angle. My filler rod is going to be introduced at about a 90 degree angle to my torch. So as I'm going across my workpiece here, I'm going to be, you know, stepping and dabbing or, you know, continuous move and dab as you go along. Um, so I always keep my filler rod um, at a 90 degree angle to my TIG torch. One of the common mistakes that people make when they're, uh, you know, beginning TIG welding is you want to make sure you're comfortable. If you're not comfortable, you're not going to be successful. So you would start your arc, and like I said, a common mistake that people make is they don't kind of plan where they're going next. And they typically will take their torch and kind of move the torch like this, and they also raise the torch up because they start running out of reach with their, you know, with their movement or, you know, they, they aren't proficient at sliding their hand across or, uh, you know, figuring out how to pivot their arm and uh, maintain the, the torch over the, the actual welding joint. And so a long arc length is going to, you know, cause issues for you. You want to maintain that, that arc length uh, or the tungsten to work distance, maintain your, your tungsten into, into being introduced into the weld puddle and step across as we go across this part. Now, you'll notice here, I'm using um, a 3 seconds filler rod. I have eighth of an inch base material here on the table. When you are selecting your filler rod for, um, for an application, if you're doing maybe like a 1 16th inch, if you have a 3 seconds filler rod with a 1 16th base material, 
it's going to take a fairly substantial amount of heat to melt off your filler rod in the puddle, and you're going to have an extremely hot welding puddle on your workpiece. The risk that you have with that is it's going to cause the material to uh, to kind of slump through, and you know you you run the risk of burning through the part. So the recommendation is, if you are welding on thin material, pick a thinner filler rod. That is going to greatly aid you in um, the amount of heat that you have to put into the part. You can use less heat into the workpiece. That's going to help you. Um, you know, you're not going to need as much to melt the filler rod off. Just as kind of an extreme example, I brought um, a 5.30 seconds filler rod over here. If you're trying to use a 5.30 seconds filler rod with a 1 16th inch base material, you're definitely going to be struggling, and that's not going to be a good, uh, a good situation to have. So, again, your filler rod should uh, typically be no thicker than the base material. And uh, what you're going to do is, even if you're a little undersized on your filler rod, just add more filler rod. That filler rod is going to act like an ice cube into a drink, and it's going to help cool your weld puddle down. So um, we've talked about filler rod size. Uh, we've talked about the different torch angles, um, talked about the technique. Oh, one of the last things that we want to kind of cover is how to hold the torch. So my preference is to use what I call a pencil-style grip. Um, because I'm right-handed, um, I do hold the torch in my right hand. My filler rod is going to go in my left hand. And so my, uh, my torch is in my right hand. There's different ways that you can hold the torch. If I'm doing a fillet weld, for example, and I have the, uh, the members straight up and down, I'm going to turn that a little bit on an angle, and I'm actually going to hold the torch um, kind of a, a, a modified pencil grip, you might say, where the, uh, the torch kind of comes through my fingers. I don't know if you can see kind of how I'm holding this, and it's actually going to be pointed you know, in towards that, that, uh, that joint. If I'm maybe welding towards myself, I can still maintain that, um, maintain that configuration, the, the, the standard pencil grip, again, finger on top, and just simply come down, move that towards me. It's going to be difficult to add filler rod in a configuration like that. If I'm doing you know, bead on plate, coming across uh, this bead on plate, if I go to this closer up zoom here a minute, um, if I'm doing the bead on plate, you can see here, I have a little bit more uh, ability to make sure my, my torch is pointed up and down this way, as well as maintain my travel angle uh, with my uh, 10 to 15 degree push angle that we're looking for. So um, hopefully that gives everybody a little bit different uh, idea uh, on how I would typically hold it. If you are doing maybe something like walking the cup on pipe, I know a lot of questions, um, you know, we get a lot of questions on different tips and techniques for maybe like 6G pipe and things like that. Um, you know, a lot of times you, for a, a, an open root configuration, you're going to be walking the cup. With that, you're going to have more of what I describe as a hammer style grip. You're going to be holding it almost like a club back on the handle. Um, like I said, more like a hammer. And then you're going to have a joint configuration uh, with this short of a nozzle. It's going to be a little bit harder with an air-cooled setup um, that we have here. It's, it's a little bit longer consumables. This is used more um, in pipe. You know, air-cooled is used a little bit more in pipe applications where they're going to be uh, more prone to walking the cup. Um, it gives you a little bit more clearance between your hand and the workpiece. Um, and then you're going to simply be um, walking the cup forward. Uh, as, as you progress through your welding joint. So uh, it takes a lot of practice to get proficient at it. Um, certainly a, a technique that is, uh, you know, kind of uh, esteemed in the industry. And, uh, but there are limited applications where it can be used. You have to typically have a, a, a pipe joint. Um, it, it doesn't necessarily, either pipe joint or, you know, maybe like a straight, uh, straight weld. You're not going to have the uh, kind of the leniency with the, uh, you know, more complex joint geometries, things like exhaust headers, uh, where you might be leaving little marks from your, uh, from your cup, or uh, a lot of aerospace applications where you're doing aluminum, you have that heat transfer, uh, it makes that cup a little sticky, and uh, things like uh, aluminum, you have a little bit larger welding pool because of the thermal conductivity of that material, 
And uh, so typically you're going to do a freehand type um, style with that. So I'm going to go ahead and get started um, getting a, a couple things ready here. So we've already kind of covered the, uh, the, the different uh, filler, filler metal size. Now we have everything all set up. We have our parameters set up. We have our gas set up. All our connections are made. Um, the only thing that we have left to do is uh, complete our welding circuit. So bringing our work clamp over to the welding table. Uh, so we can go ahead and make that connection. So again, that connection was in the electro um, or the, the work clamp side of the uh, front connectors on the machine. One thing to note is, again, this is an AC-DC machine. It automatically switches polarity. So your work clamp will always um, be in the work clamp side or the work clamp terminal. If you're stick welding and you've chosen a stick welding process, it's going to put you in the correct polarity for that. If you're TIG welding, you need electrode negative. It's automatically going to use your electrode holder side or your TIG torch side, um, give you the correct polarity for that welding process. You don't need on a Dynasty product uh, to be uh, switching the uh, terminals with your cables. If you're using a product like a Maxstar or some of the DC-only engine-driven products, things like that, um, a DC-only machine, it does not automatically switch the polarities on the studs typically. So what you'll need to do is those will be marked with a positive or a plus symbol and a minus or a negative symbol, and those you will have to pick and move your polarities as you change welding processes. So for example, um, if, if this were to be a Maxstar product, you would be looking for the negative symbol, and that's the side you would connect your TIG torch to because we use the DC electrode negative uh, polarity for the gas tungsten arc welding or the TIG welding process. So we have everything all set up, our machine set up. We have our bottle turned on. We have our gas set. Um, we have our amperage set. Um, we have it in the correct polarity for the welding application that we're going to be doing. Now, the one last thing that we have to take into consideration is safety. So there's a number of different things. A lot of people think that TIG welding is something that, well, there's no sparks, there's no spatter. We can go ahead and, um, you know, not take that type of thing into consideration. But it is something we have to take into consideration. The TIG welding process, um, you want to have safety glasses. Um, I... Uh, Years ago, when I was working at a, a weld shop before I started at Miller, um, you know, there was a, a shiny reflective table like this. Even though I had a welding helmet on, um, you know, there's uh, arc flash and things like that. The reflective light can come off the tables, different surroundings. So you always want to make sure that you wear your safety glasses in order to make sure um, that you're protecting yourself from the UV light. So anything that's a Z87.1 or higher, uh, the safety glasses will be marked on them. Um, and so they will, uh, that, that lets you know that you're, you're utilizing the appropriate level of safety glasses or eye protection. Um, an actual uh, welding helmet. So this is uh, one of our titanium series welding helmets. It's an auto darkening. Uh, it's a little bit more of a professional level. There are, uh, you know, various different levels of, uh, of, of helmets that, uh, you know, we sell here at Miller. Um, that are either fixed shade, auto darkening, uh, different number of sensors. Uh, you know, this particular version of the titanium series has the X mode in it. So TIG welding, a lot of TIG welding applications, you know, it might be a low amperage application. You might be, uh, you know, welding in a tight area where the, the light is uh, getting blocked to the little uh, light sensors on the front of the, uh, on the front of your helmet. And so the X mode actually uses the electromagnetic fields in order to darken the helmet down. The, uh, the UV light, again, no sparks and spatter uh, if you're doing the TIG welding process properly, uh, but there is still is the UV light that still can um, essentially cause a sunburn. So we want to protect ourselves from that, uh, that intense UV light that's uh, generated in the welding process. So leather gloves, um, as well as a good uh, you know, purpose design jacket. So this is uh, the one that I'm going to be wearing today is our Weldex. We do offer, you know, the cotton jackets and leather jackets. Um, now, this is just my personal preference. Leather gloves, I would say um, th there are many different styles of leather gloves depending on the type of welding that you're going to be doing. With the TIG welding process, because there is a, uh, a, an element of finesse that you need to have with both the torch and uh, one of the common ones that I hear is 
fill, uh, feeding the filler metal, we need to be able to really have that uh, dexterity with our fingers. Stick welding, you're holding on to that big stick stinger and you're looking for heat protection and um, your hand is back away from the weld. So those are typically thicker gloves. The TIG welding gloves, the purpose-built TIG welding gloves are going to be very, um, you know, very flexible out of a thinner level uh, leather material and allows you to get, you know, really good feel with your hands. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, zoom uh, back out here and I'm going to get suited up and we can go ahead and uh, give an example of a weld here. So we had a question that came in the chat while I'm getting suited up here is, um, is there a difference between the Dynasty 280DX and the Dynasty 300 that we're utilizing today? Uh, the answer to that question is uh, there is a difference in the output of the product. So the Dynasty 300 has uh, actually got a higher peak amperage, so 300 amps versus 280 amps. As far as the functionality goes, a lot of the, the actual weld performance has not changed. So if you had you know, good experience with the Dynasty uh, 280DX before, the Dynasty 300 is going to have uh, you know, the same art characteristics that, uh, you know, people have grown to know and love over the, the you know, the, the you know, past about de almost decade that the Dynasty 280 was available. Some of the things that have been changed, uh, I would reference you to without getting all in depth. Um, there's locks and limits. There's uh, uh, different guidance uh, that's available through the front of the machine with the LCD interface. There's uh, different programs and memories. We brought in independent amperage and independent waveforms on the AC side down into these smaller products. Um, so those are all different uh, elements that you can use to your advantage. I would reference our Shop Talk Live aluminum series where I had uh, gone over in depth some of the more advanced functionality of uh, independent amperage, independent waveforms, things like that. Um, just too much to cover tonight. So I'm gonna go ahead and get my welding helmet on here. And what we're going to do is we're just going to show uh, kind of the basic technique here. And then uh, I think we'll, we have uh, probably a couple minutes that we can talk about some of the uh, benefits of pulsing for uh, DC TIG welding. So again, I'm just going to do a, a, a joint on this um, material here. And I've actually got uh, the wrong material here. I'm actually going to need to bump my amperage up to about 140 amps um, for, uh, for this configuration. So again, I'm using my foot pedal to control my amperage, control my heat. I'm just gonna go ahead and run a bead on plate to kind of show the, the techniques. Again, I'm using a little bit of a push angle because I'm right-handed. Um, I'm traveling from my right to left. Um, on, on your screen, it's going to be left to right, but it's uh, right to left for me. And I'm so I'm just going to be starting the arc. I'm going to be working my way across the, the, the part and uh, kind of using a, a continuous motion with my torch hand and then using a dabbing technique with my filler metal hand. Again, we want to make sure that the filler metal is um, added into the uh, welding puddle, not melted off in the arc. So I'm just going to go ahead and dab, 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 dab. So just get into a good rhythm. I've got a good uh, welding bead width established. And as I move across the part, now when we want to extinguish the arc, you'll notice what I'm doing here. I'm actually holding both my filler metal and my tungsten over the, the uh, part that we're, we're welding on. So we want to make sure that we're shielding that, that welding puddle appropriately. Um, you don't want to just want to pull your, your filler metal back and your, uh, you know, pull that out of the shielding gas stream. You don't just want to pull your tungsten back because that exposes our molten welding pool to uh, you know, contam you know, potential contamination from the atmosphere or the air um, in the environment that, uh, that we normally live in. So 
some of the things that can, can be beneficial for, uh, for the welding process. If you are um, using a lot of stainless steel or you're more of a production type welder, you've kind of mastered the basic techniques, you can use pulsing two different ways. You can use pulsing as a, uh, as a metronome if you're using a low pulse frequency. You can use it, um, uh, the most beneficial way is uh, using a frequency of uh, 100 pulses per second or higher, and that can be extremely beneficial because it helps you know, keep the arc focused, helps prevent arc lag, and um, can help, uh, help that filler or the help your uh, welding puddle kind of follow along where you're pointing the torch. So we had, uh, again, kind of referencing back some people asking about welding overhead, uh, some people welding an out of position pipe or out of position groove welds. If your welding procedure allows it, you can use pulsing to your advantage. Or if you're trying to develop a new welding procedure, use pulsing to your advantage. It will help you reduce the amount of heat into the part. It will help that puddle agitation can help you, uh, you know, on a part that, uh, uh, it helps maintain your, your toes being a consistent width. So those are all things that you can use to your advantage. I'm going to go ahead and turn the pulser on. And I'm just going to use the standard settings um, for, uh, uh, that, are, uh, that are built into the machine. I'm just going to use the defaults. What you're going to notice um, if, it, if the audio comes through properly, you're going to hear a buzzing sound. So um, that is the actual amperage swinging through, you know, the peak, you know, the high amperage of the pulse coming back down to what I would describe as that cooling portion of the pulse. So um, let's go ahead and get started here. So if the audio came through, you, you probably heard the buzzing sound that's associated with that. Um, again, that's the, the amperage swinging through um, from the, the low amperage to the high amperage portion of the pulse. Because we are taking a significant amount of heat away from that process, our background amperage is about, with the default settings, is 25% of our peak amperage. You're going to be um, utilizing a lot less uh, energy going into the part you will probably notice that you have to turn your peak amperage up to kind of compensate for that. What that does is you get the high amperage hits uh, that help drive the penetration into the part. Um, I think I've said it in past videos and I'll say it again. Amperage drives penetration. The higher your amperage, the more heat that's going into the part um, at that very instant, and that's going to help you get the penetration into the part. So uh, we want those high amperage hits to get penetration, and then we want that low background to help cool that puddle down. The benefit for different applications, it can help increase travel speed if it's set appropriately. Increasing travel speeds helps reducing shielding gas cost. Shielding gas costs, if you're using a, a helium, uh, straight helium or helium blended shielding gas, it's about you know, three to four dollars a, a cubic foot for 20 to 25 cubic feet per hour with our shielding gas. That can be as much as $100 an hour if you're doing you know, continuous welding. So it's a very high consumable cost if you're using helium. So any, anything that we can do to help reduce the time welding, uh, that can be a big advantage. Um, so what, one of the things that I've heard from people over the years of dealing with different people in the industry is pulsing. Uh, you, you, they don't like that buzzing noise. So it's welding on steel, stainless steel. They don't like to have that buzzing noise associated with that. In the Dynasty 210 and 300, we have a new functionality called, um, you know, the pulse wave shaping that uh, essentially makes, uh, you can select either a sinusoidal or a triangular waveform that takes the noise out of the pulsing. So I'm going to go ahead and turn, uh, switch that over, and I'm going to turn it to a sine waveform. And the pulsing still is on, 
but you're going to notice that there's no noise associated with it. So you can tell it's, all the noise has, has pretty much gone away. This is a very faint hum with the welding process now. And that is, um, we're still getting the benefits of the pulser, still reducing that heat input into the part, um, still going through that pulse waveform. But now by softening that up, we're really um, helping us from an audible perspective, making a more comfortable environment and uh, allowing us to, you know, banter with our uh, coworkers if that's the case. Uh, you know, if you're in the shop by yourself and want to listen to the radio, that's really being a, a, a good benefit for us uh, from an operator comfort perspective. So, um, two last things to kind of cover. Uh, I know that there was discussion about how to, uh, a question that came in about how to feed the filler rod. I hold this, um, you know, kind of... Uh, almost like a, a modified pencil grip again, hold it loosely between the tips of your two fingers, and then I just kind of scrunch my hand like this, and that progresses my filler rod forward. It takes a lot of practice. It takes a lot of technique to, uh, to get proficient at it. Um, I've been doing this for over 10 years, and, and uh, you know, still depending on the day, might struggle with it a little bit, um, but it is something that will come with time and uh, is a good technique to, to learn if you're doing a lot of TIG welding. So, going to kind of open it up for a couple more questions. There's a question that came in. Um, I'm using serrated tungsten into my old Synchrowave 180, and I'm having a hard time. It's not really turning out too well. Um, the serrated tungsten, uh, if you're using an old transformer-based machine, if you're welding on aluminum, it may still be advisable to use a pure tungsten or the green banded tungsten, um, and then pre-ball that switch your, uh, you know, your selection tap to electrode positive and uh, pre-ball that tungsten on a good piece of you know, clean stainless steel or a good chunk of aluminum if you're welding on aluminum. In the, uh, so again, aluminum is used with the AC welding process or alternating current process. If you're welding on steel or stainless steel, 2% uh, seriated, uh, ground to uh, uh, nearly a point with a little bit of a truncation or a little bit of a flat spot in the end should be a good place to start. You should get good results with that. If you're not having good results, there's a number of factors that can come into play. I got a phone call last week from a gentleman that called me. He was struggling uh, to, get, uh, to get a good successful weld. Turns out he had a bottle of bad shielding gas. Um, it's not very common, but it does happen. Uh, that could be a consideration. So if you strike up the arc, and it flares up right away. It's it's most always a, a lack of shielding gas, whether it's you know a, a puncture in your your torch line, um, you know something not assembled properly, an O-ring missing on your back cap, uh, you know you, maybe you don't have your your gas bottle turned on, or worst case scenario you have a bottle of bad gas, or maybe if you've been doing a lot of welding, you uh, you ran out of shielding gas. So those are some things. If you if you strike up the arc and the tungsten flares back right away, that's a good chance that you have a shielding gas issue. Your polarity, if your polarity is not correct. So, um, again, I, I kind of went over the polarity. So, always use DC electrode negative with your, um, with your TIG welding process. And the, uh, with the Dynasty or our AC machines, uh, those are typically going to be uh, designated with a work clamp and electrode holder uh, configuration so you don't have to worry about switching your uh, welding leads back and forth if you're switching between steel um, and uh, you know TIG welding and stick welding for example. So we had another question that came in um, my uh, Maxstar seems to be consuming more tungsten than the old Miller welder thoughts on that um, typically if you have a DC welding machine uh, you're getting a DC welding current so um, if you have, are doing a lot of arc starts, a lot of arc starts with a high frequency arc starting can have detrimental effects that can cause an oxidation or frosting on the tungsten uh, with that high, uh, that high frequency arc start that can uh, uh, reduce the life of the tungsten between, uh, you know, the redresses or preparations. And, um, but if you are consuming more tungsten than normal, uh, look at the amperage that you're welding at. If you're using a 16th inch tungsten, you know, those are, are generally going to be used up to, say, maybe 
80, 80 amps or so, 70, 80 amps on a DC application. So if you're welding at high amperages, maybe you're using an undersized tungsten for the application. That can cause overheating of the tungsten. The tungsten brands, one of the first things I um, looked at when I started at Miller here uh, over 10 years ago was looking at different tungsten alloys, different tungsten types, different tungsten brands. And I would say that not every brand is made the same. So make sure you're using a good brand of tungsten. Make sure you're using the alloy of tungsten that's appropriate for your configuration. So for DC applications, you're going to be using a 2% a seriated, 2% uh, lanthanated, maybe a 1.5% lanthanated. Those are going to be great options for a DC application. Um, all, of, all of those are also great for an AC application for welding on aluminum. If you have, as I mentioned earlier, if you've got an old synchrowave that's a transformer-based machine, um, you can use the, the pure tungsten or the zirconiated tungsten for welding on aluminum. Um, I know we're running out of time here. I'm going to cover one last question here um, that came in. Is, did we talk about free flow and post flow? I had not covered that yet, but I can cover it quickly. Free flow. So if you are running a very long torch configuration, um, typically you, you or a more critical application, you want to run a little bit longer free flow uh, to make sure that uh, we're evacuating any atmosphere that might be back flowing up into the torch when we're not welding. So when you start your machine up at the beginning of the day or before you start welding, you know, use the purge function either on the machine um, or before you weld. Uh, you know, put your welding helmet down and purge the gas out before you bring your torch down to the workpiece. Um, that's a great option. The pre-flow on, uh, on the Dynasty machines is preset from the factory to 0.2 seconds. So most of the time, you know, we're using a 25-foot torch. Uh, if you've been welding consistently, uh, the 0.2 seconds is going to be adequate for your operation. But uh, there are certain applications you can go into the, the menus and adjust that up more to a longer setting if... Uh, if you're getting detrimental, uh, you know, weld discontinuities or detrimental effects uh, on your weld. For post flow, a lot of people think that they can turn the post flow down and it saves them shielding gas. And one of the uh, misnomers or misconceptions with that is the shielding gas is only for the part. One of the things that you have to keep in mind is the shielding gas also protects your tungsten. If your tungsten is turning blue, you have a shielding gas issue, whether it's insufficient flow or um, uh, not enough post flow after the weld, those are things that are, are signs of a shielding gas related issue or uh, insufficient post flow. We want to make sure we're shielding the part and the, uh, the tungsten as well as our filler metal if we're, or our filler out if we're using that. So the typical rule of thumb is about eight seconds of post flow and then one amp or one uh, second of post flow for every 10 amps of weld output. So if once you get above 80 amps, um, you're going to add one second for every 10 amps over that. So um, 125 amps, you're going to have about 12 seconds of post flow. The Dynasty products have an automatic post flow setting from the factory. So if you're welding you know, thick parts now and then you change over to welding thinner parts, the machine will automatically adjust based off of your, where your welding amperage is set. So um, I don't know if we had any other questions that came in. I know we didn't have, uh, we don't have really a lot of time to address it. There's probably some questions that I didn't, wasn't able to get to. Um, hopefully everybody found this uh, session on, you know, what, uh, TIG welding tips and techniques to be useful. Certainly if you have questions, um, you can submit them um, uh, via email, um, shoptalklive at millerwelds.com. Uh, so that should, uh, you can submit those and we can see about answering anything or use those for future video um, options or, or, you know, potentials to address. Otherwise, I uh, appreciate everybody's time and thank you for your attendance and uh, hope to see you in the future.